Amen. Well, thank you for that. Once again, good morning, everyone. That's it. Put your hands together for the Lord this morning. We give you honor. We give you praise. I want to kick off today's message, today's teaching, today's sermon, reading, right? Reading, a reading with the Word of God this morning. If you open your bulletins and your Bibles, it'll also come up on the PowerPoint. We're going to be reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 7 through 9. I'm reading out of the NLT this morning. Let me get my size 16 font out so I can see it. Starting at verse 7, I'll read along if you could follow along with me. It says, verse 7, Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Verse 8, Three times I begged the Lord, take it away. And each time he said, My grace is all you need, for my power works best in weakness. Oh, I don't know about you, but that's how I hear God's voice when I read his word. And a little disclaimer here. My mind worked a little bit different because of I, I did a lot of experimentation in my younger years with different things. So I literally, when, when I read the Word, when I do my devotions and there are certain passages where God is speaking, I literally hear God's voice as James Earl Jones. Right? What is it? The, fa the father of Sim Simba. Right? Anyway, that's, that's not part of the message. It's, it's not important. But when, when I read God's Word, I, I, I really try to put myself into the story and, and the Word becomes alive. I try to read it like a, like a screenplay. And so I hear Scripture a little differently, I think, than most. But anyway, that's just a little insight to me. Back to the message. This is the Apostle Paul in the, in the verse we just read. This is his second letter to the church in Corinth, and what Paul is doing is he's recounting, he, he is ruminating what God has been showing him, what God has been revealing to him, what God has been downloading to him within him, these miraculous signs and visions of the kingdom of heaven. But in that privilege and in that responsibility, God needed to remind him of who Paul was before God. You see, before Paul was the super apostle Paul, the, the one who penned the much majority of the New Testament. Before he was the apostle Paul, many of you know and remember, he was known as Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was a man who was feared as the persecutor of Christians. Acts chapter 8 says this, verse 3. It says, Paul, excuse me, Saul, I correct myself, Saul literally began to destroy the church. Verse 3 tells us that Saul would literally go from house to house, door to door, dragging out men and women, families. Families simply because of their faith in Jesus, simply for being Christian. And so the Bible tells us in that verse we just read this morning, a thorn, a constant reminder, a messenger of the enemy himself was allowed unto Paul to humble him and to remind him of, one, who he was before God, but I think equally, if not more important, who he was without God. You see, without God in our lives, I think we could do okay. I think we could manage life mm, mediocre. But ultimately, without God in our lives, we must fail. But the Bible says that with God in our lives, the Bible promises that with God, all things are possible. With God in our lives, all things are possible. Well, what do you mean, Pastor Jay, Brother Jay? What do you mean, with God in my life? What, my marriage is possible? Bro, you don't know my, my spouse. The Bible says with God, all things are possible. My wife and I are many things. She's good looking, I'm not so much. And in those many things that we are, I myself, I can stand up here and confess, I am probably the most imperfect husband that is standing in this room, and I'll confess that this morning. And my wife, the woman that she is, 
as beautiful as she is, I don't want to say she's imperfect because she's not going to cook dinner tonight if I say that. I'm just kidding. My wife is a prayer warrior. She may not have the elaborate words as, as, a, as a, an eloquent speaker would, but I know at any moment in time when I need help, when I need prayer, just this last week, as busy as she was, on the phones, taking schedules, I called her. And I know because I can hear it in her voice, but she knows when I call and I say, are you busy? I need you to pray for me. I can literally hear her saying, uh, excuse me, I'm another call. Please hold. Beep. And she'll say, what can I pray with you for? What do you need? And there was just a spirit of heaviness upon me this past week. She dropped whatever she was doing and said, right now, let's pray. And she prayed for me in that moment and in real time. My wife meets with a, with a small group of, of women called wives in prayer. And she commits to praying her and these other women for their husbands. Not on, not on that day, but throughout the week. With God, as imperfect as we are, all things are possible. And I want to encourage you guys this morning. That's why it's so important to get connected to a life group. That's why it's so important to, to, for the men to get connected with, with the men's ministry. For the women, with the women's. Because when you do life together, now you have a group of people who, who, who have intimate knowledge of what you may be struggling with, who are interceding for you throughout the weeks. We're not called to do life alone. We're called to go through it together. And so you ask, my marriage, Brother Jay? All things are possible, especially if God is at the center of your marriage. Okay, well, what about my job? Bro, you don't know my boss. Poof, my boss is the worst. I love Pastor Matt's testimony. Many of you may, may have heard it. It's a testimony that before, um, bef when he was working at Hawaii, Hawaiian Airlines, his boss should have won a Grammy and a, what, what's the other one? Grammy and, huh? Oscar. Oscar. Whatever it was, he should have took the world championship for the world's worst boss. This guy would cuss in your face, spit in everything, blah, 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 this and that. And where he was last week, and this happened because of you. And Pastor Matt's like, boss, I wasn't even at work that day. I don't care. It's still your fault. This guy was the worst boss ever. And while everyone else in the airlines was probably about ready to file complaints with the union about him, Pastor Matt was sneaking into his office, anointing his chair, anointing his telephone, anointing his doorpost with blood, saying, may the spirit of death pass this place. But Pastor Matt committed to pray for this horrible boss, to, to, to pray how he could be a better employee, how he could honor this man who is so horrible. And in the midst of that, with God, all things were possible that this boss is one of their best friends to this day. Dear friends of both Matt, Allison, and Daniel, your job, your boss, yes, all things are possible. Okay, I get that, Pastor Jay, but, brah, you don't know the things that have happened to me in my past. And you know what? You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know my past mistakes. And you're right, I don't. But I do know this. Past mistakes, they're God's specialty. Somebody say praise the Lord. In fact, this morning, for this portion of the message, can I only talk to those of you who have blown it? I want to only talk to those in this congregation who in life have blown it. And if you haven't blown it, I want to talk to those who smoked it. Because if you haven't smoked it, then you probably drank it. And if you're the select few who can still say, well, I haven't done any of those, then can I talk to the rest of you who have just simply messed up somewhere in their lives? Because if that's true and that's you, because it's me, then we're all in the right place. And I thank you, Jesus, that this church isn't a hotel for the healthy. This place is a hospital for the sick. And I don't know about you, but I need all the help that I can get. And if you're with me, somebody say praise the Lord. Past mistakes, brah, they are Jesus' specialty. And in fact, there is a great story in the Bible. There's one that I've really come to love. And it's a story of the encounter with Jesus and the woman at the well. Let me paint the picture for you. 
Jesus and his disciples are, they're heading to Galilee. And to make the trip shorter, they decide to take a shortcut, but that shortcut actually takes them through a place called Samaria. So as they take the shortcut, it's about noon. It's hot. They approach a place that is well known in the region as the Well of Jacob. So Jesus decides, I'm going to stay here. He sends the disciples off a little further into town to go and buy some food. As Jesus is resting at the well, the Bible tells us that a woman approaches to draw some water. In that, Jesus asks her, excuse me, may I please have some water from the well that you draw? Let me pause there. As I mentioned earlier, how I read the Bible and how I, how I hear the voices, I'm not, not I hear voices, but <laughs> I, 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 I literally try to read the scripture, the story as a screenplay. It's almost like a movie to me. I can feel the heat of the day on my back. I can, I can imagine the, 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 the desert dry wind and how, it, how it's just burning my lips, the, the, the sun on my neck, and maybe the thirst of some water from the well. And here comes this woman who has come to draw some. So Jesus asked her, may I, please, may I have some of the water of which you're about to draw? Now, forgive me. Because, as I mentioned before, how I hear the character behind the voice. Every time I hear or read the story of the Good Samaritan or the woman at the well who is a Samaritan, I hear them speak in a very strong Filipino accent. Let me explain why. My wife and I sponsor children through an organization called Compassion Ministries. So we, we, we sponsor two children. But before that, there was a time where it was about Christmas, and I said I wanted to do that, but I wasn't quite sure how to. An organization came by, and they offered an opportunity to sponsor Filipino children during Christmas. So I did, and I sponsored a little family through an organization called Samaritan's Purse. So every time after that, in my mind, I think of Samaritans as Filipinos. But I know they're not. But that's just how my mind works. So back to the story. Jesus is at the well. And disclaimer, my mother's last name is Pananganan. I hail from the town of Hanamalu, okay? My grandparents are Filipino. So I'm not making fun. This is just how I hear the word of God. Jesus asked the woman, may I have a drink of some of the water from the well that you drink, the well that you draw? The woman turns to Jesus and says, Isus, how is it you're speaking unto me right now? Do you not know who I am? And yet you want to ask me for somebody's water. Isus, you better recognize. Jesus doesn't even get offended at her horrible accent. He simply says this, Manang, if only you knew of the gift of God that was before you today, you would ask me for some water. You would ask me of some living water from which you would drink and you would never, ever thirst again. Jesus, son of Joseph, he doesn't say that. I just wanted to say that. The woman now perhaps captivated in this conversation, recognizing that there is no one else around. Remember the setting? Two people, Jesus and the woman, Jacob's well, and no one else around. She responds to Jesus, then suppose you give me this water, you say you have. Where? Where is it? Huh? Suppose you give me, you say you have, but where? Church is supposed to be fun. Come on, somebody. I'm having a blast up here. I don't know about you guys. She says, why don't you give me some of this water that you say you got then, Jesus? See, Jesus just told her, I got something that you need. Okay? 
I got something that can benefit you. She says, well, why don't you give me some of this stuff that you got there, Jesus? There ain't nobody else around but you and I. Jesus says, huh, hold on, pump the brakes. I ain't trying to holler at you like that. Okay? Why don't you go get your husband? Why don't you go get your husband, and then we can talk about it. Now, catch this. I always thought this story was about Jesus going beyond and breaking cultural and religious boundaries of the day. Because you got to remember, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Jews and Samaritans would not even hold a conversation with each other. The headlines in Samaria, Samaria typically headlined cultural differences and disagreements between the Jews and the Samaritans. And for Jesus to even ask this woman for a drink of water, to take that up and for him to physically drink from it, you got to remember, would make him ceremonially unclean. But when I muck of all of this, when I look at this from a different angle, I'm reminded that whenever Jesus comes to deal with something in your life, if you were, Jesus would only be ready to deal if you're ready to be real. Come on, somebody. She says this. Jesus says, go get your husband. She goes, I ain't got no husband, Jesus. It's just you and I. Jesus says this. Ah, finally you speak the truth. Now Jesus pulls back the wool on her life. He says, because um, <clears throat> you've been married five times already. Uh, and the guy you're living with now, the guy you're living in sin with now, you guys ain't even married. Her response, something tells me he is a prophet. <laughs> Jesus will always be ready to deal if you're ready to be real. And folks, hear this. The devil, the devil... A thousand times a day will remind you of a thousand things that are wrong in your life. But Jesus will always come and remind you of the single most important very thing that you need and that only thing is Him. Come on, somebody. And I'm going to prove it to you in the Word of God this morning. The Apostle Paul, as we go back to the Scripture this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul pleaded three times to the Lord, the Scripture says, that that past reminder would be removed from him. But let's look at, I found, another translation of that same response. Pono, can we put that up? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 out of the NLV. Would you do me a favor? Would you read this together with me? Ready, go. I ask the Lord three times to take it away from me. And he answered me, he said, what? In this life, the devil's going to remind you of a thousand different things that is wrong with you. But Jesus will always come and remind you, no matter what the devil throws at you, no matter what your past may entail, my son, my daughter, I am all that you need. Today we're going to seal this message with communion. The worship team is going to make their way back up. I don't know I don't know the struggles that you may have been enduring this week or in this season of your life. I don't know how much OT the devil's been pulling in your life or your family or your children, but I know the one who does. And I know when your heart breaks, so does his. I know for every tear that you shed, he collects and he keeps. I know that the love that the Lord has for you, that He is not every hair on your head, that the thoughts that He thinks of you outweigh the sands of the seashore. And whether it's a relationship issue, because remember, the woman at the well, if you ask me, I think she was looking for satisfaction through a thing called relationships. She was trying to fill a void in her life through these marriages and even the man she was with now. But only Jesus can truly fill that void. The devil's been putting old tea in your life. He's been reminding you of the past. Christ is saying, I am all that you need. And if that is truly so, and you want to accept him and receive him into your life, just raise your hand this morning. Amen. 
the Lord sees those hands, that hand too. That one in the back. Yep, my brother. All the way in the back, that one too. The Lord sees those hands. You see that one too, yep. You can put your hands down. Please repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for going to the cross, shedding your blood for the forgiveness of my sins. Forgive me of all my sins past, present, and future. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your body that was broken so that mine will be made whole. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Help me to lead and live a life pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, and everyone says,